Just a quick little introduction to meditation. This was the uh, teaching of my master Rajan Chai. He put his hand up and he waved his hand up and down like this. And he say this represents a leaf on a tree. The leaf only moves because of the wind. If you stop the wind, then the leaf moves less and less and less and less until it comes to perfect stillness because that's its natural state what we call the default state and the same with your mind it only moves because of the wind of wanting something so instead of wanting anything we just make peace with this moment just be kind and be gentle and then you find your mind becomes nice and peaceful all by itself it's just what happens when you don't do anything else and I'm sure that many of you can remember some of the most happy times of your life when you were content you didn't want anything you weren't in a in a perfect location in a perfect place you just had these moments when you're just happy to be here not wanting anything else and that caused so much peace and happiness in your mind and also in your body so meditation is not about doing something it's like learning how to be content in this moment opening the door of your heart to whatever's happening right now letting it be and then not wanting anything and then you become really 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 peaceful guess what you are fine for coming in late. I used to be a school teacher <laughs> before I was a monk. And I know that's one of the reasons why I lost all my hair. <laughs> Teaching high school kids will make anyone tear their hair out. And that's why I also know as a school teacher it was always the naughty boys and girls sat in the back. <laughs> my eyes are on you. Depends where the back is. The back is. Is no, the back? Yeah, they're in the back. <laughs> So, having given that very brief introduction to meditation, the doors are now closing. Please fasten your seat belts. We're about to take off on Buddha Air, destination Nibbana. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, fold my legs, I'm more comfortable this way. So, you don't have to do this. So now please close your eyes. <sighs> And with your eyes closed, I'm going to lead this meditation for most of the time. So if you've never meditated in your life before, no worries, no fear, Ajahn Brahm is here to guide you. So just shut your eyes and first of all just see how much you can relax your body. Just sit comfortably. This is not work, it's the opposite, it's the art of relaxation. And meditation, when it's done properly, is fun, it's joyful, it's easy. Which is why in this afternoon's talk, I call this session Club Med Manchester. And you know what that means? Club Meditation. Happy, relaxing, a holiday from the busyness of your life. So when your body is, you think it's reasonably relaxed, just look again. First of all, your legs dangling over the chair, or for me, just crossed. How do they feel right now? Be aware, just notice the sensations or feelings, the tightness, the aches, the tension, the pressure, anything in your legs. And move them to try and find the best position for your legs the posture the right meditation posture is not the same for everybody it's not the same every time you meditate you feel the best position for your legs adjusting them moving them until you find the optimum most comfortable position and even if there's an ache or a pain during the meditation it's quite okay to very slowly move your legs if you need to to become comfortable this is not Guantanamo Bay where you have prolonged stress positions 
This is just kindness to your body. So mindful and then kind. And then look at your bottom pressed against the chair. How does it feel? If you need to adjust the position on the chair, please do so. What we're practicing here is some awareness together with kindness. Awareness allows you to get feedback. Your bottom is this position, you move it. That feedback which that awareness gives you allows you to find the best position and the kindness stops stops you moving when you find the best. And then you move up your body to your back. Many people have back pains because they do not have awareness of how they've got their body positioned, especially their back. You don't always have to, uh, to sit ramrod straight. You can lean against the back of the chair if that's the best position. So you find the best for you today. <coughs> if necessary, move. And then once you are satisfied with the position of your back, then where are your hands positioned right now? Are they comfortable? Many people sit down, they fidget because they don't spend enough time, enough care, just noticing where their hands are, making sure that they are comfortable there. Just like when you set out on a journey in your car, you make sure everything is on board, enough fuel in the engine, before you leave. Same way we're checking on our body to make sure it's comfortable before we start meditating. And then check again your shoulders and relax your shoulders. Sometimes people have difficulty knowing how to relax. So there was a, a simile which I was using this afternoon which I'll repeat again. Just imagine that your, your shoulders are made up of a lot, a lot of strings, elastic bands, which have been stretched. And because they've been stretched, is the tightness, the tension, the stress in your shoulders. And just imagine letting go of both ends of that elastic, so it gets looser and looser until there's no stress. Your awareness of your shoulders will tell you from feedback if those shoulders are relaxing more and more. Little by little you are learning how to relax your own body. If the shoulders get more tense the mindfulness gives you feedback, will, will tell you that. And then you can look at the neck, many people have neck pains. Just to be aware of any sensations in the neck and move the head until the neck feels very comfortable. And lastly, see if you can notice the sensations in the muscles around your eyes. And see if you can relax those muscles. Sometimes it does take trial and error to know how to relax, but when it does relax you can feel it. The tightness, the tensions change into something which you recognize as being free, relaxed, nothing being pulled or stretched or squashed. By putting awareness, mindfulness on those muscles, you find that everything gets loose. And it's not just about relaxing the body, it's a learning how to be aware of just one part of the body and how to 
relax it, bring it to a greater sense of peace and comfort and health. And then just you're aware of your whole body sitting here, checking every part of it, relaxing it, comfortable. But I go one step further in the awareness of the body and learning how to relax it. You go to a part of your body which is still aching or tight or in pain. There's always something there. If you have a cold, or irritation in the throat, irritable bowel syndrome or whatever, there's always something there. So zoom in on it, as you focus in. And once you have awareness of a part of the body which is painful, tense, <coughs> then you can learn how to relax that pain, even if it's in a part of the body which your hand cannot reach, which movements of the body you know, do not help. Deep inside your body, you can be aware and learn how to relax that part of the body. As I said this afternoon, I teach this the wonderful effect to people or women who are suffering from breast cancer. To be able to heal their own body by focusing on that part focusing on it and you can feel what makes it relax, become at ease, heal and what makes it more tight, what makes it more sick. The awareness of your own body and the kindness which relaxes everything. So my body feels very relaxed and there's something which I notice as the delight of a relaxed body. Feels so free, no tightness, nothing squashed or pulled, everything just as it is, there's no force. And that feels very delightful. And then once the body has been relaxed part by part with mindfulness and kindness, now we go to our emotional world, the mind. And first of all, as I introduced this afternoon, there is something I'm asking you to look at which I call the peaceometer. I have a speedometer in your car. So to understand what I mean, how peaceful are you now or how agitated? Give it a score, a number from 1 to 10. 1 is really, really peaceful. 10 is very agitated. When you're peaceful you have very few thoughts. When you're agitated the thoughts are just almost uncontrollable. So how peaceful or how agitated are you? What you're aware of is what I call the peaceometer. Just like you're aware of tightness, tension, pain in the body, now you're aware of how peaceful or how agitated you are in the mind. Now, see what's necessary to bring more peace to your mind. When you're mindful of the right area, then you soon see what makes you more agitated, more peaceful. You get feedback, just like when you press your foot on the accelerator, the speedometer needle goes up. When you release the pressure, it goes down. You find out 
what is necessary to bring more peace to your mind? What makes it more agitated? You will find it's the same kindness opening the door of your heart to this moment, making peace with this moment, being content with just being here. That brings the needle of your peaceometer closer and closer to one. And keep your attention inside the mind. If you send it outside to the noise of the cars, to maybe an ache or a pain, heat, cold in the body, it gets distracted. Keep it inside, just on how peaceful is your mind and how to make it more peaceful. And very often in meditation, at this time, quite naturally, people become aware of their breathing. So, anyway, if you're not aware of your breathing, just see if you can become aware. And to help as you breathe in, imagine you're breathing in peace, health, energy if you're tired. As you breathe in, Imagine these good qualities, peace or energy, coming into your body with every in-breath. And as you breathe out, you're breathing out all of the difficulties, the pain, sickness, worries, anxieties. All of that negative stuff going out with every out-breath. Breathing in peace. Breathe out. Let go. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go. Just a natural rhythm of the breathing. <coughs> breathing in joy, happiness. And breathing out any negativity, any fault finding. Breathing in joy, happiness. Breathing out negativity. Breathing in peace. Breathing out let go. Always one breath at a time. <coughs> With no concern about the breath which happened a few moments ago. No concern about the breath which is going to come next. It's natural. You don't do the breathing. You just observe the breath. <coughs> breathing in peace. <coughs> breathing out, let go. There's no need to name or assess <coughs> or just to take notes in your mind about what's going on. You can do that later on. All you need to do, all I recommend, is to <coughs> enjoy. Enjoy the peace of this moment. You're not going to be tested or examined. <coughs> you just let this moment be. If you do need to cough or move, please do so. Don't force yourself. That creates more stress and tension. Just gently, just if you need to cough, cough. If you need to move, slowly, gently move. Relaxing your body, relaxing your mind. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go.
no force, no pressure, relaxing to the max. I'm going to be quiet now for a few minutes. When I start speaking again, it'll be a couple of minutes before the end of the meditation. So just enjoy, see what happens.
<coughs> how is it going now? How relaxed is your body? How peaceful is your mind? What does it feel like to have a relaxed body at ease? What does it feel like to have a peaceful mind? Just happy to be here, not going anywhere, not trying to get rid of anything, just being content, just being at peace. By making peace, being kind and being gentle. Please just observe three more in breaths and out breaths, in out, in out, in out. At the end of the third out breath, open your eyes to end this meditation period. After three more breaths. Please, out of kindness to myself and Venerable Chanda, please smile when you come out of meditation. Otherwise I have to look at a whole lot of miserable faces. <laughs> Thank you so much. Excellent. Oh. So, if you're sitting comfortably, <laughs> then I'll begin. No, no. So, now you've done a little bit of meditation and it allows me to just get my energies back because <coughs> I use my meditation to really start giving myself an oomph of energy. Which is what happens. It's just, there's something else about this uh, path of meditation which I'll just mention that when you learn how to be in this moment, not do anything, be kind, be content, you don't need to think, you don't need to plan or burden yourself with all these memories. Instead, you stay in this moment, just still not doing anything, not going anywhere, which means you're not wasting any mental energy. And if you don't waste the mental energy by thinking, planning, doing stuff, you find all the energy of the mind, which would usually get wasted in complaining, thinking, planning. That all gets collected together and it just brings energy into just the knowing, into the mindfulness, into awareness. You literally become more aware and with that awareness more energised. It's like a free form of energy mental energy through stillness, through not wasting stuff. So I've often used that to, after the end of a busy day, just to energize yourself so that you can just serve and do stuff for others. So it's not vitamin C tonight, not the coffee I had a couple of hours ago, it's vitamin M, vitamin meditation pure, powerful energies. And I love using that because that's a little secret technique which you can use to empower your mind when you have to perform. Many, many times in my life, you know, you travel a lot, you do a lot. I was just reminded, I only arrived from Australia uh, on Monday afternoon. That's only what, two days ago? And so now, seven hours different is now for 26, that's 2.30 in the morning. So my body says, you should be fast asleep. But my mind says, no need. You've got energy, power. So 
This is a little trick which I've used very often, very effectively, and also totally off topic, but I hopefully you felt that when you started experiencing your body, really mindful of it, learning how to relax it, amazing things happen to your body to make it really health healthy. Had so much real good success in using this meditation to heal people's bodies that in many places that you're getting, it's no, like in Toronto, every year I go there uh, Toronto University invites me to teach as part of the course, degree course in uh, Buddhism, medicine and psychology because there's a few things there which are very powerful for people's health. I did mention with cancers which is, it's terrible that so many people have to you know, endure so the pain, the difficulties and the fear of cancer in today's world, yeah you have to sort of go to the doctors and stuff, but number one, wouldn't it be wonderful that you went to the, see the doctor and it wasn't there, the cancer wasn't there. How can you actually do that? You know that a lot of people are so unaware of their bodies that they just do not see or do not feel the, the, the imbalances, whatever you wish to call it, the aches and the pains in the body happening in the first place. Until when it actually happens, you know, it's a bit far gone. It's the same when reading a medical journal, heart attacks don't come from the, out of the blue. You know, if there is sort of problems, that um, cardiac problem t gives you many signals, you know, before the big one hits. But many people, they're just not aware of their own body. They're totally oblivious to it and so they don't ch check the signs, they don't feel it. And so even as a monk, sometimes I've been in situations a long way from anywhere and you have no real choice, there's no doctor available. And one of those little stories, again off subject but who cares, you're in here now so you can't get out, <laughs> you can complain afterwards. One of those little stories was, you know, no exaggeration, being in a uh, monastery in Australia, in my cave where I live, I had food poisoning. Now, not exaggerating, it's real food poisoning, it's sometimes you don't know what people give you to eat. Today, because this was Manchester and uh, I, um, uh, it was almost like a resolution something which I haven't done, which I meant to do for a long time, for many years. Because some of my friends, especially friends from even university days, kept on telling me that the best fish and chips are from Manchester. So I had to check it out and basically I think they're right. <laughs> had a delicious lunch today. Ate too much but who cares. <laughs> But, it's sometimes you don't have a choice, people just give you food. And sometimes you don't know what you're eating. And so sometimes you get tummy ache. For a monk it's called occupational hazard. But sometimes it's worse. And this time it was full-blown food poisoning. I was in my cave and every few seconds, ah! Oh, ha! Ah. Whenever you give a talk, it's very helpful to every now and again go, oh, ha! Ah. Because it means people don't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, there was, and you, you can't stop it. It's just um, automatic reflex. So, then I thought, what should I do? Let's go down and call a doctor or an ambulance. But by the time you get to the telephone, and by the time you know, I don't have a mobile phone as a monk, it's so wonderful not to have an iPhone. You know what an iPhone means? Idiot phone. 
So an idiot because you know, it controls you. It's not a convenience. You know, you have to keep checking it, just in case. And people can actually contact you any time of the day and night. So it's great when you don't have one. Freedom, peace. But anyway, there you were in your cave. Ah! Oh! So, instead of complaining or getting an ambulance, which take about half an hour, you'll probably be dead by the time it arrives. So, you have your other option. Exactly what I told you. You're aware, mindful of the feeling. And you're trained enough to know how to relax it. So just giving this beautiful, it is like kindness, compassion. Learning how just to relax this pain in your tummy, in your digestion, or your intestines, whatever it was. And little by little, because you are aware, you can feel it get worse or get better. Worse or better. And because I've been practicing like this for a long time, it's pretty easy for me. You're very aware of the body, so you can just relax it, relax it, relax it, relax it. Every minute it got a little less painful until it was 20 minutes and it was totally gone. There's no pain left. Never came back. Full blown food poisoning and now there was nothing left. Digestion perfect. No aches and pains at all. It really was um, quite some, no exaggeration, it was really quite impressive. You can have full blown, it's that bacteria in the body, something was in there and the bacteria is supposed to be um, multiplying and irritating your, your um, digestive system, causing these cramps and now they were, they were gone. And sometimes I just wondered as a scientist, what were those bacteria doing? They must still be there, but I figured it out that I imagine those, I don't really know what a bacteria looked like, but I imagine that are blobs with all these like tentacles coming off it. That's my imagination. And so I imagine all those little blobs actually crossing their tentacles, sitting calmly in meditation <laughs> in my digestive tract, not harming me at all. I don't know if that was true, but certainly they didn't do anything after that time. But that was a wonderful way of dealing with the problem. Even um, anxiety, which is a common problem in today's world. The key story was a, um, a young student in Adelaide University who had chronic anxiety disorder, so much so that she was bedridden in the student accommodation, not even able to get out of bed, to go for a walk, to do anything, let alone go to the studies. So, she uh, had obviously free access to doctors, uh, the psychologists in the university, psychiatrists, no one could help her. So to the rescue came Ajahn Brahm, like the 7th Cavalry, like Spider-Man, like Iron Man, this was Super Monk. Flying, well I didn't fly to the rescue, just the uncle, you know, who was a disciple of mine, sort of said, can you help her? So she called from her bedside. And so, the therapy, the treatment, was very simple and highly effective. I said, when you have a panic attack, where do you feel it on your body? Because every emotional problem has a corresponding physical counterpart. So she said, oh, I feel tightness in my chest. I said, where? Well, in my chest. And I said, I want coordinates. Measuring from your navel, how many centimetres up to the left, to the right? Is it an oval area? Or is it a square area or circular? How much radius? I want a very accurate description of the area where you feel that tension, that tightness in your chest when you have anxiety attack. Call me in three days and give me a report. 
Now what is important you know, in, for doctors, for therapy, is that you don't do everything for the patient. You let the patient you know, have some control over some input into their healing. Otherwise, it's just basically you depend upon others. You're not part of your treatment. And that takes away a lot of your integrity. So, three days later, she gave me a really good description. She was actually doing dentistry, she was really good at science. So she gave me, well, it was about 3.4 centimeters above my navel, you know, a little center about a little 1.2 centimeters to the left, sort of an oval area, maybe just uh, the shortest diameter was this. And really impressive. I said, great. Now, how does it feel? I said, well, it's tense. Not good enough. I want a clear description. Now, I know for doctors, when you go to see them, it must be terrible for a doctor. I say, no, I, it hurts. Where? Well, roughly here. What does it feel like? Well, it's painful. There's a million different types of pain. How can a doctor find out what's going on when you say things like that? You, because a lot of the time, number one, we don't have the language, and number two, we're not really aware enough to really investigate it. So this girl, gave a thorough description, three days later, of the pain, how it feels, burning tight, you know, how it extends across her tummy, how it sort of starts off and how it sort of develops. Brilliant. It was an exercise in mindfulness, in awareness, so she could actually know the location and the feelings thoroughly, not just superficially. And the next thing was the kindness aspect of this therapy. I said, so next time, now you know what it feels like when you have an anxiety attack, a panic attack. Now, next time that happens, get your hand and massage that area with as much kindness and gentleness and compassion as you possibly can do. At the time she had a living boyfriend who was one of these boyfriends, you know, from heaven. If you get a boyfriend like this, get a ring on him as soon as you can. <laughs> he would wash for her, cook for her, look for her, after her, because, you know, she was bedridden. And, said, if you can't do it, you feel too weak, get your boyfriend to do it. You know, boys would actually quite like that, rubbing your chest. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, they didn't when I was a young man. I don't know these days, anyway. But anyway, I'm sure that's true. But she said, yeah, and I said, call me in three days' time. So she called again in three days' time, and I said, well, how did it go? And he said, well, yeah, I did what you said. And I said, what happened to the physical counterpart of the anxiety when you massaged it? And she said, oh, after a couple of minutes, you know, the tension, the tightness in my chest vanished and disappeared. And then I asked her, what happened to the anxiety? And that was one moment which I will never forget, the Eureka moment. She was silent for a few seconds. And then she said, the anxiety went as well. By, by dealing with the physical counterpart, the feeling in the body, then the cause of that, the anxiety, the emotional problem, that went with the physical counterpart. So great! Now you know what to do. And I hung up. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, out of, hot, out of bed, back to university, got first class honours, and very uh, privileged that as soon as she graduated, she came back to Perth to marry her boyfriend, insisted that I did the ceremony of blessing for them. And so I was their hero simple thing to actually overcome anxiety because so many emotional problems and it is mental health week so so many emotional problems whether it's depression, anxiety, fear anger even have a manifestation in your physical body and if you instead of some people, most people aren't able to deal with the emotional world but my goodness they know how to deal with the physical world with mindfulness and kindness so I remember that because 
even on the plane from Perth to Singapore before I changed to get to London. There was one fellow uh, sitting just on the opposite Ah, oh, you Ajahn Brahm? Yeah. Oh, my father goes to your talks in Singapore. He was one of the pilots in Singapore Airlines, James Koo. He said, what are you doing in Perth? He was following in his father's footsteps. He did some training uh, as a pilot. And he said, I'm going back to Singapore tomorrow. I have uh, two interviews. One with, I think, Scoot, the other one was Tiger Air or something. And he said, I'm so nervous. I don't know what to do. And I said, get your hand and start rubbing your tummy before you go in the interview. Because the anxiety and the fear, if you try and get rid of it in your mind, it gets worse. Physical, just massage it. And you find you relax. <laughs> the people are already doing that. And there's also, there was this doctor, a Bangladeshi doctor, who told me that, you know, if you can't hear, it goes down, let me know, and I shall put it up again. The Bangladeshi doctor, she said that she was just uh, um, dealing with many patients. One of the patients had such severe anxiety that she was on oxygen all the time, even just can't breathe properly. So, according to the medical uh, directive at the time, you had to try the first um, medicine, medication, to reduce the anxiety. That wasn't working. So then there was number two, a whole list of medications. And she came to the last medication after a couple of weeks. Nothing was working. It was a Thursday afternoon. She wanted to go home to her husband and kid. And so she did something which she, you know, if it didn't work, she'd get a big problem for. She said, OK, normal treatment doesn't work. I'll try Ajahn Brahm method. So she told her to actually, whenever you have anxiety attack, feel it, get to know it, exactly where it is. And don't worry about the anxiety, the physical manifestation. Rub your tummy. So that's what she said. And then she went out of the ward, went back home, relaxed. When she came back to that ward the following morning, the woman said, it worked. She had the oxygen mask off, I'm going home. And I really scolded that doctor. You should have done that straight away. It would have saved the, the health service fees of Australia a lot of money. It actually works. So there's many things you learn from this meditation which I just taught you, which is highly effective. Now, in dealing with problems, mental problems, mental health problems and physical problems, which is wonderful to be able to see and to be able to help. Just one last little anecdote, some of these really move me. The fellow who came to one of my meditation retreats in Perth a lot, well, like, yeah, a couple of stories. Can't resist this, because it inspires me, and it works. So, uh, one of the <laughs> people who came to see me on one of these nine-day meditation retreats, he came wearing a rubber face mask. And I thought, you know, who are you? You know, are you some sort of um, deviant, fetish person? <laughs> I don't know these things, I'm a simple monk. <laughs> So he said no, and he actually opened up his shirt. He had psoriasis, this rash, and he said, it's all over my body. He lifted up his trouser legs, and this disgusting rash covering the bottom of his legs and over his face, every square centimetre of his body. He said, I have to wear this mask because to stop me scratching my, my skin off my face. And he said, whatever the doctors had given him, nothing had worked. Psychiatrists had not been able to help him. And so, again, one of the last throws of the dice, as they say. Now try some meditation. And he came up to check in with me, saying, I don't know if I can last an hour here. It's itchy all the time. You can't sleep at night. It was torture. And I was so good, proud of him because he lasted the whole nine days. When he came to check in with me at the end of the retreat, he wasn't wearing his face mask, 
because his skin was perfectly clear. And with a big grin on his face, he tore open his shirt. Look at this. Totally clear. He lifted up his trouser legs and there was an inch, a square inch of ring of psoriasis over both his ankles. He said, this is all that's left. Many people couldn't stand this, but this is nothing, this is nothing compared to what I brought into this retreat. Thank you so much. And that was not true, that really moving, that you can actually take so someone and give them some freedom. Another guy, I'm really getting into this now, totally off subject, but I'm inspiring myself. Another guy, he came on one of the meditations and at the question time, I got all these complaints. Can you please ask people not to breathe so loudly during the meditation? He was really... <laughs> <laughs> And so I answered the complaints by saying, that gentleman has got a huge tumour in his nasal passages. He's dying, his doctors have given up hope, and he's come on this retreat again. Nothing to lose, last chance. He can't breathe like other people because there's this huge tumour in his nose. He has to breathe through his mouth. And at the last meditation he did, he came running to me and said, something happened. And he described it as like a popping sound in his nose. He could breathe through his nose, just for one minute, and then it closed up again. But for him, that was just so encouraging. For me, I thought he'd left it too late. Just like a kid who only does the, res uh, does the swatting the night before the exam. Bit late. But, to my great joy, about three or four months later, I was in Sydney and this guy came up to me and said, do you remember me? Please don't do that to me. I see many hundreds, thousands of people every year and you expect me to remember you? <laughs> and I have to be honest. I say no and offend you. <laughs> so it's just normal, you can't remember everybody. So, sometimes, instead of offending somebody, I learned this trick. So, you know, you can be honest without offending people and say, Oh yeah, you're the person whose name I keep forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little trick which we use in our <laughs> profession. And let's be authentic, you're not telling a lie, but you know, you're not offending people either. So anyway, this guy came up and he said, do you remember me? And I was that time I said, no, who are you? He said, I'm that guy who had the big tumour in my nose. I kept on doing what you taught me and the tumour's totally gone. Remission. And now he said, whatever years I've got left, I'm spending teaching that meditation to others. I thought, that's the best. It, you know, some of you come here, you see me on YouTube, you say I've really helped you, you don't need to thank me. The Buddhist way is, well, I've helped you, you're in debt. And the only way you can pay off that debt is helping somebody else. Don't come and help me back. Help somebody else. And that way the help, the kindness, the service goes on and on and on. If I help you and you help me back, it's finished. If I help you and you help somebody else and they help somebody else, you find it goes on and on and on, endless, which is beautiful. So you don't just say thank you to me, you have to do the same to somebody else, serve them, and that way there's no end of the kindness and generosity. But, uh, what was the last, I forget the last um, little story now of you know, how the meditation and the relaxation has helped everybody, but anyway, I think that's enough. Just that gives a huge amount of satisfaction that this is powerful stuff, and it's hard actually to to get people to really look at it. John Kabat-Zinn did a lot of good work with pain, uh, pain uh, management using mindfulness, but with the kindness as well, it brings it to another level of power. It works, it doesn't cost anything, something you learn and something which is highly effective. 
you know, for your life. So that's my business, serving. And Oh, the last one, <laughs> it comes to mind now. Because all these YouTube talks, every now and again, you get, this is one email I got back from a lady in Poland. And she said that she had been suffering from severe arthritis. Now she was an elderly lady. And arthritis, an inflammation of your joints. Sometimes you've seen people suffering that disease. And sometimes you know, their, you know, their, their limbs are deformed because of the pain, because of the inflammation. It's a gross disease. And the medication she had to take would never cure that ailment of arthritis. But she had to take them to get rid of the pain. Otherwise she just could not get through the day. And those medications had severe side effects. So she wrote the letter to me that it wasn't much of a life at all. You know, but she had to take those medications, otherwise it was uh, unbearable. But she said, she heard this little meditation and she practiced it and she said, and I'm indulging now because I get emotional when you've really helped somebody. And she said, I don't need to take the medication anymore because the arthritis is gone. And imagine you get an email like that, that somebody, just one person, had been in severe pain with no hope and you get some sort of technique, some sort of method which can actually take away that pain once and for all. And arthritis, gone. Arthritis is an inflammation. So maybe you can do it. <coughs> you can do it. In her case, it worked. So that's why that I'd love to get this stuff into the medical mainstream. And the only way to do that is to get trials. But it's very hard to get funding for such trials because there's no money in it. <laughs> the drug companies can't turn a profit when it's something you do yourself. But anyway, that's another, another thing. But the main talk this evening <laughs> on author, oh look, I'm, I'm practicing authenticity in my work. You know, this is what happens. But it doesn't always happen the way you expect it. Sometimes mistakes happen at my work, at other people's work. But you know that where I learn how to deal with mistakes, bang, thank you. <laughs> Bang. Okay, the way I learned how to learn, deal with mistakes was when I was a school teacher because I had to set my first math exam in school and that's something I'd never been taught before. How do you set an examination? A test. And so I went to a senior teacher and he gave me some wonderful advice which I uh, extended to just life. And it became what I call the 70% rule. Because he told me if you make the exam too easy and you know, all your students get 90%, 95%, that examination is not worth anything. But if you make it too hard, so the average score is 40% or 50%, your students will come away from that test thinking they can't do math. It's too hard. They lose motivation. So try and set the average score to 7 out of 10, 70 percent. That's a reasonably good mark. It means, yeah, you can do maths. But the 30 percent where they made mistakes, that was important for me, their teacher, so I could identify what part of my lessons they hadn't understood which I didn't explain carefully enough. It was my feedback, so in the next lessons I could address those points where they made mistakes. If they'd never made those mistakes, I would not know. So I could not sort of deal with things which I thought they understood, but which they hadn't. So that's what I did, try to aim for 70%. And then I realized the same happens in life. 
If you always score 95%, 100% in life, if you are one of these people who always win, always have good luck, never have any difficulties or problems in your life, you have fun but you don't learn anything. You don't grow. You're not tested and challenged. If you're tested and challenged in life too much, and your score is 50%, 40%, you get depressed and you think you can't do anything. But 70% is the best score in life. Yeah, you're not perfect. You make mistakes. But you're doing reasonably well. And where you make mistakes, that is the growing part of life. That is where you learn to do things better, to improve, to grow, to extend. So, when I realized that, I realized that making mistakes is not something wrong, it's not something bad, it's the most important part of life because there is where growth happens. So, whenever a mistake happens, you don't hide it under the carpet, you don't deny it, you learn from it, you grow from it. So, the, uh, the acronym which I use in Australia, they have a football code which is very popular called Australian Football League, AFL. So everyone in Australia knows AFL, what that means. But I use that, AFL, as what to do with mistakes. Number one, acknowledge. Don't hide it. It happened. Forgive it, which means no punishment. Don't, it's the punishment which hides mistakes. And third, learn from it. Grow from it. It's not that you're afraid of making mistakes. You welcome mistakes because that's where you learn and grow and do better. Unfortunately, most people have got it into their brains that if you make a mistake, there's something wrong with you. Bad, stupid boy, you got it wrong. As if you make a mistake and it's a personal failure, a scar on you. You learn that from, your, from when you're young, when you're at university, when you're at work, which means people hide the truth, they don't admit to mistakes in life. Which is totally unrealistic. Everybody does make mistakes. And I love telling people about my mistakes. Such as, that part of my job is to visit people in hospital, in the ICU, last chance. So there was a Chinese family in Perth and their patriarch of their family was in ICU dying. And they wanted a Buddhist monk to come and do some prayers, some chanting for them. So I was the one they wanted. So I went into the ICU in Royal Perth Hospital and when I want to, I can chant. <laughs> My chanting can be very powerful sometimes. I can really give it full power. Zap them with my superpower chanting. And that's what I did to this old Chinese gentleman. It was like a miracle. He came out of his coma. He recovered. And that is where the shit hit the fan, as they say. That is where I got into big trouble. Because a family came up to me and they were really angry. They said, what do you do that for? <laughs> the whole family had come from Hong Kong and Singapore and mainland China to be with their, their senior relation in the last moments in their life. They'd actually already arranged a funeral service. <laughs> They'd taken time off work spent a lot of money flying from overseas for the last moments and then this western monk comes along and they get better now they have to cancel the funeral service or go home and they have to come back again later on whenever he dies properly next time 
I really got scolded for that because they told me they didn't want sort of me to chant for him to get better. <laughs> they wanted me to chant so he had a peaceful death. <laughs> it was my mistake for not asking. So these days. <laughs> These days, whenever any, whenever I go to a hospital and people ask me to chant for someone, I always ask, what do you want? <laughs> Get better chanting or die peacefully chanting. <laughs> I learn from my mistakes. <laughs> that actually happens. But you know, I grew from that. <laughs> so if ever you want me to bless you, chant for you, please ask which one you want. Don't blame me afterwards. <laughs> so another mistake I made which turned out to be very lucrative. On a retreat we have personal interviews. Those are people can come and ask you know, about their meditation, what's going on. <coughs> so on a retreat last December in Kuala Lumpur, this couple came in you know, for an interview. Young couple. And the girl did all the talking, she was asking all these questions of me and every now and again you know, turning around to the guy. So I thought, you know, they had some sort of relationship together, I thought they were married. And so at the end of the little 10 minute interview, just because you know, the guy was silent all the time, I thought that was a sure sign that they were married. <laughs> <laughs> Please excuse me for being <laughs> stereotypical, but I assume that totally wrong of course. So, <laughs> at the end of the interview I said, oh is that your husband? And both of them burst out laughing, almost hysterical. She said, that's not my husband, that's my dad. <laughs> he said, I'm only 16. And I said, well you looked at least to be in your early 20s and your dad he looked like to be maybe in his early thirties. I thought you were married. And you know, neither of them complained. <laughs> the daughter, only sixteen, was so happy that she looked like a, a twenty-two year old or twenty-three year old. Because you ask your daughters at that age, you want to be a bit older, you know, so you can get into nightclubs or pubs or whatever, I don't know. So she was very happy that she looked older. And as for her father, oh, he was over the moon. <laughs> but I thought he was a 30-year-old. He was so happy with my mistake. So they went outside and they came back five minutes later with a hundred dollar donation. <laughs> now that's actually how to raise money for the <laughs> <laughs> But on the donation little form there's a little note for your monastery, but please use some of it to go to the optician and get your <laughs> prescription checked. <laughs> well, who cares? I mean, they were happy, you made a mistake, and tell everybody. <laughs> but, making mistakes is wonderful. Number one, it shows you're human. Number one, it allows you to get feedback from others. Not, you don't feel embarrassed about it. You just learn from it and you grow from it. And also that when you share your mistakes with others, it means that you're a human being in this world. No one is perfect. How wonderful that is. There is no such thing as a person who never makes mistakes. There's people who hide mistakes, that's all because they're embarrassed or ashamed. That's a big problem. And because people hide mistakes, that's where we get deceit and lying from. Because you know that it's a very important precept in Buddhism not to tell lies. But, why do people tell lies? So it's not a case of thou shalt not. You say, why? It's not saying you should not get cancer. You should find out why do people get cancer. Find the causes and work it out at the causes and so the effect never happens. So one of those little anecdotes which told me about why people lie to one another 
there was this little uh, this Sri Lankan girl she's about 18 or 19 and she'd been coming to the temple ever since she was really small and it's, you know, it's really good to have a monastery where you can take people like you know, a nun's monastery here because you know, your children get to know the nuns and they feel comfortable not only that, the parents trust the monks and nuns as well so you're like an extra part of the family which really helps enormously as this anecdote uh, shows so she came to see me, I've known her since you know, her parents took her to the temple when she was small and she said, Ajahn Brahm, I'm in big trouble I said, what trouble? big trouble, she said I'm pregnant from my boyfriend I said, have you told your parents yet? He said, no, that's why I've come to see you. They will kill me if I tell them. Can you tell them for me? <laughs> and you know, I was, I was quite touched by that. <laughs> that, you know, that she trusted me enough to you know, help her out of a, a difficult situation. So I was really quite flattered. Oh, thank you for you know, giving me the opportunity to trust me enough to do that for you. So I did that for her parents. Like, you know, people make mistakes you know, sometimes, you know, human beings you know, my brother, you got my cousin, second cousin at the back my brother, when I was visiting some time ago and he was busy doing something, and I was telling my nephew and my niece you know, my nephew and my niece, they don't call me uncle they call me muncle <laughs> which is, which is the, the word we use, you know, when you are <laughs> when your uncle's a monk so anyway <laughs> so they were asking me, so what was our father like, you know, when he was our age <coughs> so I was telling all the stories of what he got up to you know, when we were young and you know, the my nephew and niece were so fascinated, they couldn't get enough of these stories of what their father was like when, when he, was, uh, he was their age until my father came in, and my brother came in and oh, what are you telling my children? <laughs> All the things you got up to when you went, don't say that! <laughs> I'm trying to train my children not to do all the silly stuff I did but we all do silly stuff when we're young, being human so we don't need to hide it you know, we acknowledge that you know, Dad was a human being Ajahn Brahm was a human being you know, I wasn't born a monk so I just, you got you know, two people who've known me for a long time at the back there they can tell all the stories of what I got up to when I was young I don't mind that, it's good fun just a human being <laughs> so anyway uh, so, oh you know, because my brother just took me past Acton where I used to live you know once I was very lucky, he really looked after me, he saved me from I don't know what but I was just, just I was, must have been about 17 uh, staying at, the, at the, this little flat and then I was walking out going somewhere, I forget where and a police car stopped, in those days I was way ahead of my time fashion wise my jeans had holes in them I thought that was cool so it's also cheap as well and so uh, a police car came past and stopped and they asked me a question where were you in the last hour? you know if a policeman, you don't expect that so oh I don't know can you get in the car sir? and I got in the car and he got on the radio and said I think we've got him <laughs> <laughs> and I said oh, what do you mean got me? I said, I, I was in the flat, I was actually, what I was doing you know, I, I had already a place at Cambridge but I didn't have any interviews anywhere and I thought, you know, I want to go for an interview somewhere so I was actually reading prospectus for Sussex University I said I was reading the prospectus, they didn't believe that because I had holes in my jeans <laughs> so, fortunately, before they actually ran off my good karma, my brother just happened to be looking through the window at the time and he came running down to, to save me he said, no he was in the house, he was actually doing that, he was reading a prospectus <coughs> and so they let me go, my brother saved me so, and I wasn't always, you know 
<laughs> you know, always this, this beautiful, perfect, um, bald-headed uh, Buddhist monk to be. I got up to trouble as well, mischief. You know this. Oh, should I tell all these stories? <laughs> Why are you? This has nothing to do with the the subject of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the time, it was crazy that you think that these big universities are very refined but you know sometimes they're not. They had every year at the college they had what was called a scholar's dinner and this was actually, you know, for the scholars, only about 10% of us were the scholars. And we went for this huge seven, no, nine course meal. And we started off with sherry in the, uh, what's it called, in the, uh, the, the gallery, you know, built, designed by Sir Christopher Wren. And had these servants were in, like butlers in coats and tails. This was full on high class. And so when they, they came around serving sherry, at the time I was doing maths before I went on to theoretical physics. So with a friend we worked out that the, the butlers were going around this long table in a clockwise direction. If we went round in an anti-clockwise direction at the same speed, we would meet the butlers twice on every circuit, thereby scoring twice as much sherry than our friends. <laughs> we thought that was being smart. And then when we went for the dinner, nine course meal, every course was served with a different wine. And the butlers, you know, it was, you know, is your wine glass half full or half empty? It was never more than half empty because as soon as it got to that level this butler appeared on your right side to pour out some more wine. And after all of that we went to the old library for port, claret and Madeira. Someone told me a joke this afternoon. He said they went to a cake shop in Manchester. Most of the cakes were two, two pounds. No, were five pounds. One of the cakes was ten pounds. I said, why is this so expensive? This is my dearer cake. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of you. Who was responsible for that this afternoon? One of you. Right, but I promised I'll tell you, my dearer cake, my dearer. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm just getting into it. <laughs> okay, where was I before I was doing cake? Oh yeah, Cambridge. Oh, I better not tell that story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what you want. <laughs> Tittle tattle. <laughs> I think you've been conditioned by the Daily Mirror, the Sun, all of the, <laughs> the naughty stories. But it wasn't really naughty. But I learned from that. After that, Claret, Madeira and Port. And then, they had this big goblet came down. And it was massive, encrusted with priceless jewels. And it was filled, I forget which, which wine, it didn't make much difference at that time. <laughs> and you had to drain it and then say the college toast in Latin. <laughs> it wasn't very clear Latin pronunciation, but I did that with everybody else. And that's probably the last I remember. It was absolutely ridiculous because I, I woke up in my room very, very lucky because when I opened my eyes there was a big pile of vomit next to my pillow. It's disgusting. And I realised you can choke on that. You can die very easily. And the next day, the whole day, I felt that maybe I should have choked on it because I felt terrible. <laughs> And everyone was saying, oh, what a wonderful night that was, what a wonderful... And at least I had enough rebellion in me to say, that wasn't a wonderful night, that was terrible. <coughs> and I felt so 
ashamed that all of that incredible food which some of the best chefs had made for me well, it was on my pillow. <laughs> While there's other people hungry who don't have enough to eat. And that just, that was a stupid thing I did, but at least I learned from that. That was the last alcohol I ever took. That was it. I'm not going to take that anymore. It didn't make any sense at all. You know that was a bit of a sacrifice? You know, giving up alcohol? Because I thought no one would invite me to any parties. But I got invited to more parties afterwards. The person who could drive them home afterwards. <laughs> the person who could look after them. And so it was wonderful. So anyway, but I learned from those stupid mistakes I made. So, with that lady, that poor girl, I had to talk with the parents. What really shocked me was why is it that a girl in big trouble would not ask her parents directly? She was afraid to tell her parents. Why is it that probably still in UK, certainly in Australia, people who are gay are afraid to tell their parents? Why do they, what's going on there? Why is it that your son might be in trouble with drugs and they're afraid to tell you? And think that they get scolded, punished, you'll shout at them. The times they need their parents the most, when they're in big trouble, they don't tell them. So there's something which I'm encouraging people. What I learned from that is for goodness sake, those of you who have children, please tell them that son, daughter, you can tell me anything. As long as it's the, as long as it's the truth, we won't punish or scold you or drive you away because that's what parents are there for. They're to help you through some of the most difficult times of a young person's life. We all make stupid mistakes. Some of those important parts of your life, as long as you're telling me the truth. Maybe you can scold them if they tell lies, but please, if they're telling the truth, we do make mistakes. Mistakes are important in life, it was what we learn. I don't want to be scared and never actually just you know, push the boundaries of science, of development, of relationships. Push those boundaries sometimes. That's where we learn, where we grow, we do things a bit differently. But, don't be afraid when you make a mistake. We're not here to scold you, to punish you. We're here to help you. Yeah, you did something stupid, but I did many stupid things when I was young. The important thing is, we're here to help for you to learn and to grow from it. It happens. So, and the same with relationships. Boys and girls, you're married, are you going to make mistakes in life? Of course you are. Have you got a good enough relationship you can tell your partner your faults and weaknesses? Please have this beautiful relationship and tell your partner, as long as you're telling the truth, darling, I will never scold you. I'll be disappointed sometimes, but you know, I'm here to be, for, be here for you, to help you in the difficult times. Please tell me. Yeah, ew, why do you do that? But people do make mistakes, as you make mistakes. So I want to be there for you, to help you, we'll solve it together. But when you lie, look, you often tell people. I spend a lot of time in Singapore, Hong Kong, and know sometimes that so many of the rich people there, they have mistresses. You know why? Because some of those people say, oh, I can get away with it. I can hide it. My wife will never find out. That is so dumb. Guys, if you have uh, a relationship, a fling outside of your relationship, <coughs> your marriage, he or she will find out. And the example I give is General Petraeus. He was the head of the CIA. He was an expert 
in covert operations. <laughs> but you know how he got busted? He had a mistress, and if the head of the CIA can't keep it secret from his wife, guys, you've got no chance. <laughs> so forget it. She's going to find out. You're going to get busted. No, no, no other alternative. Same the other way around. People find out. But the delusion is that we think we can conceal it. You can't conceal it. It's much better just to bring it up, first of all. That, you know, you're... In, Imagine like there's some other guy or girl you really like. Tell your partner about it. Say, look, you know, you're the partner. You're the one I want to stay with. But, you know, I've got lust. I like other people. Please help. And when you work together, you can actually have strategies so it never happens. So you can keep together. So all those little techniques is why we lie to one another is because it's not in our interest to tell the truth. We're afraid of telling the truth. And that breaks up families, that breaks up relationships. So I, when I do marriage ceremonies, that's also one of the things which I encourage the partners to do. Look, you're together. Please make a vow that we can say anything to each other, as long as it's the truth. We won't get upset, angry. We won't scold. Please let me know. Because we're in this together. We have to work it out together. There's no way you can work it out if there's lies. Politics. Why don't we trust politicians? Why do they lie? Because if they told the truth, then you would kick them out of government. Give politicians a break. When people were really upset and angry, why did Donald Trump get elected? They say because he's a representative of the American people. That's why many, what many American people are like. <laughs> it's democracy. <laughs> so, don't blame the representatives. Blame the people who get sucked into that stupidity. <laughs> so. That means we actually look at the causes of things rather than complaining about the results. So, like even in business, why is it that businesses are sometimes corrupt, exploit each other? And you notice that the businesses which have a long-term viability, they're the ones who have this brand recognition of being trustworthy, of being good. Having a monastery is like having a business. Sometimes I call myself the CEM, the Chief Executive Monk. <laughs> I have many monasteries to deal with. You get personal relationships with the people who are your builders, your backhoe drivers, all the other people, you know, who have to work for you. You have personal relationships with all the donors who look after you. And those personal relationships, when you really are honest, trustworthy, for example, there was a lady, a very wealthy lady in Thailand, who donated 50,000 Australian dollars to build what we call a stupa, like where you put Buddha relics in, a huge mound. You see them over in Thailand, Burma. But then after she gave that donation, we made a resolution in our monastery. What do we need that for? The real relics of the Buddha are the teachings, not these bones. And so we decided not to build one. But she'd already donated the money. So I made a special trip to Thailand to find her and say, can we return the money to you? It's the only honest thing to do. Because we're not going to build that stupa which you gave the donation for. And we had full uh, intention of giving the money. That's a lot of money. But she said, no, thank you for that. We trust you, so use it for something else, whatever you decide. But that's what we do to be trustworthy. Because if your religious leaders aren't trustworthy, honest, 
how can we inspire you? You'd be a hypocrite if I didn't sort of walk my talk. Do as I teach others to do. It's so important. So anyone who ever goes to the monastery where I live, my home is a cave. And sometimes it's not really my home anymore, it's like a tourist attraction. <laughs> people say, can I see your cave? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where I live. So people actually look at it, inspect it, go under the mattresses, see if there's any Playboy <laughs> magazines under there. <laughs> there ain't. So you've got nothing to hide, but the only thing is to be you know, that open, to let people have a look and see what's there. That's really important. Because that is that honesty which builds trust. And in my business, my monk business, not monkey business, monk business, that we're developing very well. I have franchises, I call them. Franchises in Sri Lanka, the Ajahn Brahm Society, where I'm going to give some talks there soon. Over, where else? Over in Sydney and in Melbourne, building a monastery over there and in uh, Singapore, the Brahm Centre and the uh, Bodhinyana, no, it's Buddhist Fellowship, so the spiritual patron there. Over in, where else? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Uh, they call it the Biff Society, the Bodhinyana International Foundation. <laughs> don't know why I call it Biff, they don't know what that means in, in Australia, <laughs> I mean Biff. <laughs> and what else is there? Oh, it's, yeah, I said Sri Lanka, the Brahm Society. So now, it's something else, somewhere else. Malaysia, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship over there in Penang. Indonesia. Indonesia, yeah. That's the Ahipasiko Foundation. There's all these other Buddhist monks over there in Indonesia, but they say I'm the most famous Buddhist monk in Indonesia, and I don't even live there. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but what it does mean is that you have brand recognition as we deliver. <laughs> so, the reason I'm here is because of this young lady beside me, because she is a bhikkhuni, a fully ordained Buddhist nun, with no place to stay. <laughs> In, well, for tonight she's staying somewhere, I don't know where, but... <laughs> No place to stay in Australia. She hasn't got a monastery. She hasn't got a place to stay. Sorry? In England? Yeah. So, my organisation has another motto. Rather light a candle than complain about darkness. Do something. So that's what I'm here for. Building a monastery for women. Fully ordained women. Yeah, I sacrifice my time, but even more than that, stood up to all the friends who I'd known for many years and I ordained bhikkhunis because they weren't there before and for that lost many of my friends. But you know it's one of the beautiful things, one of the things I would always be happy with and pleased with. There was a moment in my life when it was a very clear choice, just buckle and have my friends or stand up for this women's equity they have down there in front of this building without equality there's no democracy I noticed that sign so I said no you can kick me out but I am supporting bhikkhunis I did that but that's not enough so we built monasteries for nuns this beautiful bhikkhuni monastery in Australia Damasara. Look at it on the website. It's really beautiful facilities. So, women, if you are Buddhist and you want to become a bhikkhuni, a fully ordained nun, you are treated with respect instead of treating as B class um, Buddhists. I've done that, but there's a certain amount I can't do. I got a lot of my disciples, who was an that Indonesian man, I just harangued him, just um, <laughs> put the hard word on him and last year he donated £400,000 to that project. It's happening. 
I deliver. <laughs> so we're going to have a bhikkhuni monastery, one way or the other. That's why I'm here. It's going to work. Just a matter of when. So if you want a piece of the action, donation box outside. So that is actually how we have authenticity. Yeah, I make mistakes. But I learn from them. And I keep on going on. One mistake which I will never make is actually to, to um, abandon a project before it's complete. That's something which one of my predecessors noticed. I will keep on working until it's finished. There's a sense of commitment. And for those of you who want to know the difference between commitment and involvement, Q&A session. Okay, Q&A session. In a bit. In a bit, okay. We've only got 20 minutes for that now. Doesn't matter. Involvement. When you're involved in something, it's the difference between bacon and eggs. In involvement, in, in bacon and eggs, if you really think about it, if you're smart enough, you'll realize in bacon and eggs, the chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. <laughs> I apologize to any vegetarians here, but you know, that you can understand what we're talking about there. The pig is its whole life committed. It's going to keep on going, not going to stop. <coughs> but the chicken walks away. So, don't walk away. Commit. Whatever you're doing in life. If you have a relationship together, make it a, a pig relationship, not a chicken one. Go, go, <laughs> go all the way with it. And then you find there's, there's something which is really inspiring for that. Inspiring in companies, in work, it's authentic. Yeah, you have a vision, you have a dream, you make it happen. It's like sometimes you don't see the results, like planting a tree, planting a forest. <coughs> sometimes 200, 300 years people see the results of that. Have you ever been down to the New Forest, just uh, north of Southampton? I did a retreat down there years ago. All those trees were cut down to build ships to fight the Spanish. But some wise people, for every tree they cut down, they planted three, knowing that many wouldn't make it. And now you go down to the new forest. It's inspiring. You can actually have environmental devastation and you can repair it. Somehow or other, this earth is very forgiving. It's amazing what you can do to it, but it will come back with effort and with commitment and with respect that this is important. People who lose hope in this world, so you can't lose hope. Commit. And then there's nothing you can't do. That is the authenticity. That's something which hopefully you can inspire people to follow. Doesn't matter what obstacles, we'll get there eventually. And to give this nun and all those who want to, you don't have to, but if you want to use this opportunity for full ordination, follow this path, peace, beauty, joy, service to others, it's there for you. The opportunity. So, that's why I'm here. So, there we go. I don't know if that really was what you expected, but that's what you got. <laughs> <laughs> so now, the questions and answers. Absolutely. Gain much, much more respect, because it's something which never felt right. We could exclude anybody. It's not just the... Um, the equity for women, it's equity for anybody. You know, I, once I stood up for the gay community in Australia simply because I gave a talk once and this person came up to me afterwards and they said something, I think I mentioned this afternoon, it just went straight into my heart. It hurt me. When he said, with passion, with pain, that religion has been very cruel 
to the gay community. He was right. And you know, in that moment of openness, you could feel his despair, his pain. So, okay, I'm going to do something about it. So I tried my very best. It obviously worked because uh, some years ago I got my invitation to the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras breakfast. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> you know, I did something, okay, because so many other religions are cruel. And it does make sense to me. The core teachings of Buddhism, of the Dhamma, may all beings be happy and well. It's indiscriminate kindness, even to enemies. Just melt them with love and kindness, not with ballistic missiles and threats of annihilation. That's so juvenile. But, and it works. So even now, if you follow the Australian news, sometimes I'm embarrassed to be an Australian <coughs> because they're having a same-sex marriage uh, vote. <coughs> and they know what most Australian, poll after poll after poll after poll, have said, yeah, of course, let's have it, no problem. What's a problem? And if you look at religious history, Marriage has never been part of religious services. It was made a part of religion much, much later in history. I think about four or five hundred years ago. Karen Armstrong did a wonderful example of that and saying it was made a sacrament because that's, please excuse me, that's the way the church could control people. It was never originally part of any Christian dogma any sort of Buddhist dogma, so any, it was free what you wanted to do in your own home, as long as you were kind, not sort of um, exploiting people, not hurting others, but actually banning, not treating people equally, that does hurt people. It hurts people very badly. And I don't know about you, maybe I'm just too soft. People say I should put more salt in my meals because salt hardens the arteries and hardens your heart as well. I'm too soft-hearted. <laughs> but no, that's only joking. But you just... Why do you do that? You can't do that. You have to give people equity. And even recently, I mean, you were telling me just Rohingyas in Burma and Bangladesh and in Sri Lanka and India. I don't know, you have a lot of information where this came from, but yeah, we can say blame this, blame that, blame somebody else, but the point is there is homeless families got nowhere to live who had to run away for their lives. Got no, in great poverty, great strife. So, we can actually say, oh, this is wrong, this shouldn't be done. So many people can say that, but let's do something about it. So, just last Sunday, raised 6,000 Australian dollars, not that much, to send over to, to Bangladesh, to actually to be of service to anybody who's in need. May all people be happy and well. You see, don't see who's at fault. Is someone hungry, you give them something to eat. Why they're hungry, we'll deal with that later on. So it's important to do that. To show some, as you told me, show some leadership. Do something which Buddhists mean they don't need to be embarrassed about. It's important to do that. So I don't know, you have to be very careful there because there's so many conflicting interests. It's politics. And so you have to tread very carefully. So I hope I did the right balance there. It's on YouTube. So it's important to do things like that. So, to create a better, happier world. We can do that, so we have to do it. So let's do it. So it's all part of like, the spiritual life. Next, mo next month, 
on the 9th of November, I'm coming back to UK. It's a long way from Australia. Coming back just for two nights. And the reason I'm coming back, it was an invitation which I just couldn't refuse. It was in Cambridge, my old university, they have a Cambridge Union, a debating society. And it's the president is Stephen Fry, and they have all these really interesting debates. And they wanted me to come back for a debate. It's on, this house has lost faith in faith. This house has lost faith in faith. And they want me to speak for the motion. I've got to argue that yes, the United Kingdom has lost faith in faith. And in opposition, we have this scallywag called Russell Brand. <laughs> <laughs> and he apparently is speaking against the motion. He said, no, that we haven't lost faith in faith. Now that's really, that's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, those are the sorts of things which, you know, you love to do because it shows a bit of leadership, but a little bit of moving things forward so people feel proud. Like a lot of times, your monks and your nuns are like the football team you support. That was actually the BBC did an interview and they made a very, you know, intuitive <coughs> and very accurate sort of description. Those of you who are Buddhist, you want your leaders actually to show leadership, be something you're proud of. So we say, yeah, I'm a Buddhist. No, I'm proud to be a Buddhist. We're actually doing something. We're creating some harmony, some growth, some leadership in this world. We're not just sitting in our case meditating all day. It's nice to do that, honestly. It's a great sacrifice. You know, you know, you know, you love to just be in a cave all your time meditating, same with me, but you do this because you need to. So let's make a better world. Let's make some equity and we've got all these incredible ways, not just with medicine, little ways of actually creating peace and harmony in this world. Powerful ways. Good example. Now I said this, teaching it for a long time in Australia, and you know that somebody must have taken it on board because it was uh, a lead article in the Melbourne Age, just after the last Australian election. You so, say, is it really democracy? The way we elect people. First of all, you know all of your people who are standing for election, they're called candidates. You know where that word comes from? Candid is a Latin word for white. Because in Roman times, Anyone standing for election to the Senate had to wear white clothes. That was actually signifying that this person is standing for election to the Roman Senate. And again, the reason why they wore white clothes was a sign of their purity, of their honesty, of their self-sacrifice. In ancient Rome, you were elected to the Senate not on what you promised to do in the future, but on what you've done in the past. On a past record rather than future promises. And I will never ever blame any politician who breaks promises. I blame them for making promises in the first place. Who knows what the weather's going to be like tomorrow? Who knows what the economy is going to be like? Who knows you know, the changing political, geopolitical situations of our world? You can't predict those. So why the heck do you make promises which you won't be able to keep? If you were electing somebody to the, as the CEO, the managing director of a company, would you elect them on what they promised to do for the future? Or would you look at their past record, their CV? The CV is something you can check see how they've managed problems and difficulties in the past. Why can't we do that with politics? Please, let's get out of the, the habit of believing promises. Let's look on past records.
what people have done in the past, rather than what they promise in the future. Look at people's honesty, hard work, self-sacrifice, selflessness. Those are things which we would let people on. And secondly, why is it that everyone has an equal vote? We assume that that is democracy. Why is it that some people say, well, with something like climate change, you're in your 80s or 90s and you have the same vote as someone who's, say, 18. Those in the 80s or 90s, you're out of here soon. You won't probably have to experience the result of bad policies. But the 18-year-olds, they've got more stake in what we call life. It's going to affect them much more than anybody else. So it's just like in a business, the more shares you have in a company, the more votes you have. The more shares you have in life, the more votes you should have. It would skew the democratic system to those who are young and lessen the power of those who are old. Because you're out of here soon. You've got not as much stake in the decisions which are made. Imagine what that would happen. What would happen, sort of, in the British Parliament if you had the life expectancy of a person and that was, say, the amount, you know, the, the years left, that would be the, the votes you have. Now, some people say, are oh, you ex more experienced the older you are, you are? Sometimes more bigoted and dogmatic. But something has to give because people aren't satisfied with the political system. Just because it's been happening a long time doesn't mean you can't change it. Tweak it. So actually I've been saying that. There's something you may be able to do. But now someone has took it up in a major newspaper in Australia. Even if that doesn't suit you, at least you can start to see the logic. Just because it's worked for a long time and now it's broken, surely we can do something about it. Think outside the box. Try something different. See what happens. So who knows? Is it time? Okay. One more question. My answer is you should take half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other question? Yeah, I'll try and be quick. Yeah. Could you still practice without the uh, fully? Ordination, the full ordination. I mean, could, could we still practice the Tama? Of course. Instead of uh, fully uh, awakened. Um, it's personally, you could practice so much, but there's something which is like missing. You know, you're not true to your practice. There is, um, why are we ignoring other people? So there will always be something in the back of your mind saying this is not good enough, this is not fair, this is not right. And there's something to do about it and you don't. There was, I did a fundraiser, when I was in Singapore, I had a free afternoon, believe it or not, this was many, many years ago. <laughs> and one of my friends, he was doing a fundraising walk. It was a Buddhist library in uh, Singapore. They built this huge library, taken out a huge loan, and they were heavily in debt, and they were trying to raise funds to pay off their debt. So I had a few afternoons, so I took many of the people who were in my tent, they come on, let's help somebody else. So we went over there, and because I was well known, I was, no, the abbot was, how oh, Ajahn Brahm here, wonderful. Can you give one of the speeches? And so, um, there was a politician there, as there always is, and uh, I asked the politician, and, uh, are you going to come on the walk with us? He said, no, I'm just going to give a speech. So I went up there, being cheeky, and I said to the crowd, and now we're going to have, uh, I think, Minister Luke, I forget, Lucy or something. Anyway, that this minister 
He's now going to give a speech, but he's not going to go on the walk. He's one person who talks the walk, but doesn't walk the talk. <laughs> <laughs> and because I knew him and he knew I was being cheeky, he just laughed. So he never actually put me in jail or expelled me from the country. <laughs> but that was true. If you're going to give a talk, you have to walk it. And that's important. He talked the walk literally, but he never walked the talk. <laughs> so somehow there's unfinished business and you just, you can't ignore it. So you have to do something. If it was asking whether you could be awakened without ordaining. Well, be awakened without ordaining? Mm. Is that your question? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're now in Manchester. You know, you, you don't have to, you know, you can walk to London. You can do that. But when there's a train, or a bus, or a car, you'd be stupid to walk all the way to London when there's a beautiful vehicle which you can take. Even more so, I say, well, it's possible to walk from Perth to Sydney, it's about 3,000 miles, <laughs> to a desert, you can do that, it's possible. But you know we've got aircraft these days, so you can actually go in a plane. They're, they're pretty cheap. So why would you want to walk? We've got this beautiful Sangha, monks and nuns, Buddha air, which is pretty cheap. So why would you want to practice the hard way? Yeah, you can become enlightened as a lay person, just like you can walk from Sydney to, to Perth. But you'd be dumb to do that when there's an aircraft available. Do you get it? Can I have a couple of keys to the airline? <laughs> Certainly, um, but they co all they cost are very cheap. They cost your hair. Actually, my next question is: I wonder about whether what do you think about a monastery for a couple? For a couple? Yeah. Okay, it's just like one of my friends said they'd really like to be a monk as long as they could have every Saturday evening off. <laughs> And another person once told me they wanted to ordain, this was some years ago, but they won't ordain yet until after they see the last Harry Potter movie. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't watch movies when you're a monk. <laughs> so, look, you know, if you're a monk, you're a monk. That's why you know, we do have separate monasteries for monks and nuns. If you want to know the reason why, it's because, you know, People who don't know think, oh yeah, when all the lay people go home, we know what happens. And this is my father, remember, oh. Terry? No, they, I've got to tell you this. <laughs> this is what, one of his favorite jokes, he's always telling jokes. He would come home, this is a long time before I even thought of becoming a monk. He would ask, what fun does a monk have? Answer, none. <laughs> That's self-deprecating, it's not true, <laughs> but that's what people think. They do, because I had that experience, we built us in, we were building our retreat centre, and had all the people were walking past, you know, when they're having their lunch break, and they're telling all sorts of crazy things about what monks do. Because even today, many people think that you cannot live as a celibate. You have to have some hanky-panky on the side. It's like you have respect for gays, that lifestyle, lesbians, transgenders, but you know the last thing which we haven't really got is respect for celibacy. People think that celibacy is unnatural. And they say that to me, celibacy is unnatural. Just like you know, they said before that it's unnatural to be to be gay, to be lesbian. So, the next Mardi Gras, I'm going to get a float. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrate lights. Okay, time out, sorry. Hope you enjoyed that. So, useful, maybe not what you expect, but you know, some interesting stuff, challenging stuff, informative stuff. Thank you for listening.